I'm Bill Davenhall, and I'm the Senior Health Advisor for Esri, a U.S.-based uh, global corporation. Nobody in public health likes to hear that. Just like the real estate people didn't like it when Zillow and Trulia came around, right? Because now if you want a piece of real estate information in your neighborhood, most people don't call a realtor. And that's because we've become citizen realtors. But there's still a, in process, you, you still can't do these transactions efficiently unless you have a realtor in most cases involved. And probably somebody to take exception to that. But I would say that's what's going to happen in medicine is that we're going to have all this data and all these tools available to us. We're going to come to the doctor's office and we're going to say, okay, here's the situation from my point of view. You know, um, what do you think? And the doctor isn't going to be able to get away with saying, uh, well, you know, or giving um, body English that sort of says, I'm the doctor here. My first experience, my doctor looked at me like this and said, uh, Dr. Google, called me Dr. Google. That's what he called me, Dr. Google. You're spending too much time at the computer. And I would say later on that doctor became a, a real advocate who, when I showed up at his office, he would say, come on into my office. I have something I want to show you. And he would go there and call something up and print it off for me. And that began, I began to realize that they are beginning to recognize that patients of all ages are going to be coming in now a lot more sophisticated than they've ever been before. And they're just you know, it's not that they have the answer to everything. I think that's part of the cultural change, is that I don't expect my doctor to have the answer to everything. There's no possible way he or she could, right? So why not be a, have a partnership? So I would say that's, that's really my motivation to talk, you know, to people about this thing called geomedicine. Well, I, I think to have a partnership means that um, you don't lie to one another. Right, so um, I've, to I've told many physicians that, that um, if we don't have a partnership, I'm, li I'm likely to lie to them. And the reason is, is as patients, we all get into a in situations where we, we actually know something about what's wrong with us. And we have some clues as to what we probably need to do. And we may not always know what's caused it, but if that's getting like, we, we can have more resources now to go look that up. I mean, you actually can go to the internet now and take a picture of a rash on your body, submit it to the internet, and it comes back and it suggests what kinds of rash you have. Now, when you look at the technical aspects of that, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's a rash that looks like this, you know, 100% of the time. So, you know, you probably have that rash. So, this thing about trust had to be with, if you want me to tell you all, if you want me as a patient to tell you everything, okay, then you have to make it easy for me to tell you everything, and you just can't send me off. You know, if I start down a trail, and then you start off down a different trail, and I don't want to go down that trail, then I, next time I just don't say anything. I don't say that, uh, that this hurts. I just keep my mouth shut, because I know if I say this hurts, you're going to send me down to this lab, and it's going to be another long stream. So that's what I mean about catchers and jumpers, is that as a patient there, I'm really a jumper. And I'm expecting that catcher to do their job, which is to catch me. And yeah, that might be some hard, hard talk and everything, but I'm saying I'm trying to get this across that, that in, you know, this is what we're going to have to learn how to develop our systems on is this element of trust, which is not a technical term. It's a cultural term. And it, it's, um, um, trust is created at the moment of a transaction. So it's not something you easily can get over if it went bad or something you can manipulate, you know, you either have to catch persons or, you know, you have to, or you have to be a confident jumper. So that's what I was meaning by that, by that graphic is that, uh, so after everything is said and done and we've played with the technology and we've exhausted all the innovation, we still have this element of trust between a, a consumer, a health-seeking consumer and a, and a practitioner who's trying to be our coach. And once we sort of figure out how that data is going to support that trusting environment, then it's going to work very well for us. Citizen Epi is, is a concept, and it's basically saying that these tools that we use in geographic analysis are going to get easier to use. There's going to be less training involved with them. And as I like to say, mere mortals are going to be able to use these tools. 
And when that happens with what I call open health data, which is a movement that's sweeping across the world, where we're all beginning to understand that some of this data is our data and we actually own it, uh, government is starting to produce more data by uh, greater amounts of geographic granularity, which means we're getting down in the UK to postal codes that are much more useful than working at trust boundaries or county boundaries. Right? So that's what I mean by citizen epi, is that the, the magic that the public health epidemiologist always had is, is slowly evolving. It, doesn't, it probably means they're going to work on bigger projects. They're going to worry about bigger things. But what I'm saying is we have examples all over the world where citizens gathered together and identified clusters without the help of an epidemiologist. Now, they finally ended up getting some help after they made so much noise. So it's like, it's, it's like they became advocates for the consumer that said, hey, you know, we're not, we're not sliced, uh, sliced uh, liver out here, mm -hmm. whatever the saying might be in London, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not just fizz in the drink. We, we actually, these are the people that are being affected by this, and we basically think something's wrong in our environment. Health department, would you help us understand what that is? So you're having these tools come into the marketplace, you're having the data flow in, and then you're having very innovative people to take these tools and data and put them together. And some of those are at this meeting. So you, you, you see these community of innovators. Uh, I met a couple people that are from different industries that have nothing to do with health, okay? But they see their innovation as being something they can contribute to this, this whole movement of trying to find better solutions using health data.